Hello. Hello. It is such a delight to be here. My name is Julie Stoliachuk. Today I would like to talk to you about how we learn languages. And there's something that I don't believe has been mentioned today, although it's certainly uh, at the backs and maybe even at the fronts of your minds. Do you know what the theme of this year's conference is? Perfect, yes, it is slow learning indeed. And that's why I thought it would be a good idea to go back to the basics. Because, you know, activities and tips and tricks are wonderful. I myself am hoping to get a lot of these at the conference today. But it's also very key to come back to our core beliefs about how language learning takes place because it is this, these beliefs, they are these beliefs that shape what we do in the classroom that shape our classroom practices. As, as very kindly mentioned, I am indeed specializing in C1, C2, C2 plus uh, levels. And I do run several courses on methodology. It's something I'm very passionate about. Uh, the methodology courses I run are usually based on methodology books by some of the ELT greats. And one book that I will be drawing on heavily today is called How Languages Are Learned by Patsy M. Lightbone and Nina Spada. It's a great book, highly recommend it. And the reason I think it's useful to go back to these theoretical ideas, uh, you might think they are very theoretical, but they do have a direct impact and influence on what we do in our classrooms. For instance, if I believe that people learn languages through imitation, I'm probably going to include a lot of listen and repeat activities in my classroom and so on. So what I'd like to take you through today are some ideas that researchers have agreed upon regarding how children learn their first language, their mother tongue, their L1, whatever you want to call it. Before I, well, yeah, okay. And then we're going to see how much of this applies to second language acquisition, because we here are foreign language teachers or second language teachers. Before I put any ideas in your head, I would like you to do some reflection on your own. For this, I will need you to get out your notebooks. I mean, I, you can use your phone, just make sure you don't switch to checking messages immediately. Um, if you could get your notebook out. And what I'd like you to do, there will be two or three instances throughout this talk where I will ask you to do this little bit of reflection. Take a minute to write down one, two, maybe three points. Any ideas that you have about how children learn their first language. It could be anything. Anything that you know is true about children learning their first language. I'll give you a few seconds. All right, have you got something? At least one bullet point? Great. So I'm going to take you through five or six, and then I'd like you to tell me, I will ask you later, whether there was any that I've missed or if we have some matches. So first and foremost, the first thing that we know and that researchers know about first language learning is that pretty much every single person on earth speaks a first language. Uh, children who are deaf can learn to communicate using sign language. Children who've got developmental delays are still able to catch up and well, to acquire a certain level of proficiency that's uh, sufficient for them to function in the world. So that's that's the first <laughs> that's the first um, kind of uh, that's the first point that all researchers can agree on. Are there cases when children do not acquire a first language? Okay, yeah. So there are. Do you know what what kind of situation that might be? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a highly unlikely scenario. These stories are very few and far between. But indeed, um, these cases are referred to as 
feral children, although it's a debatable, it's a questionable term. Um, one of the best known examples of this is a girl called Jeannie, who was discovered at the age of 13, um, having been neglected. So, um, and she she did not develop her first language as, as children normally would. So, in the unlikely, in the very unlikely event that a child is denied all social contact, all human contact, that's pretty much the only case when the, the child and the person does not acquire an L1. Everyone else generally does. We can do so quite effortlessly. And um, the thing that researchers don't know is how exactly this happens, but one of the most celebrated scholars in ELT and in S well, not in ELT, in SLA, uh, Noam Chomsky, proposed that inside every human brain is something he called a language acquisition device, something that allows us to effortlessly pick up any kind of language, and that, he says, explains why it is equally as easy for uh, a person growing up in America to learn English as it is for someone growing up in China to pick up Chinese, right? So universal acquisition device. So yet coming back to Genie and these cases of so-called feral children, these um, tragic stories, because that denying children social contact is a crime, um, have given researchers evidence of something called the critical period hypothesis. So, um, so the, the meme says the brain can learn any language effortlessly, but only when you're too young to care, uh, which is very true. There is a critical period for learning an L1. This means that a person has a certain, a certain window of time by which they have to be exposed to their first language, and that's when they learn it. This is usually between the ages of five and puberty. So by the age of 11 or 12, a person must have social contact, they have, must have language contact in order to acquire a first language. Uh, yep, that's true. <laughs> so another point is that children receive thousands of hours of input before they are expected to produce language. At what age do, do children generally start speaking at? Yeah, it, yes, it depends, of course, of course. Yeah, around a year, yeah, a year or um, upward, of, upward of one year. Um, yes, indeed. So we know that by that time, by the time that year elapses, the child will have received thousands of hours of input. Um, the, this comic strip says uh, where the mother goes, baby, go bye-bye, and the child says, has she not considered the effects of such limited, ungrammatical input? So um, baby, go bye-bye is an example of how, how parents talk to children. This, the, um, the scientific term for this is modified input commonly known as baby talk. Uh, teachers do this to students as well. Uh, modified, uh, modified speech, modified input in the classroom is called, is sometimes called foreigner talk yeah, or teacher talk, right? Um, language that is simplified in order to facilitate learning. So kids have it good in that, in that sense. Because they have these thousands of hours of input, Another side of the same coin is that they are allowed a silent period of over 12 months, right? So, and uh, in the picture is, of course, a silent period that extends well into the teenage years. I'm sure we, we're all familiar with a situation when, as a child, you'd have to just stand there and listen while your parents finished a conversation with their friends. So, um, and yet, this is an important factor in children learning how to speak they are not expected to produce verbal responses, although they, they do produce all other kinds of responses. They are not expected to produce extended stretches of very grammatical speech, right? There is, um, there is space for error in this process. Another point that researchers have agreed on is that L1 acquisition follows a certain set of developmental stages. 
Now, uh, we, we usually cover this in the very first session of the How Languages Are Learned course. And, um, you know, I show them this, we do, we do an activity where we put certain items in order. Let's say babies first start cooing and then they start making, um, sh you know, short syllables and then they start combining syllables then they add rhythm and so on and so forth. Uh, and there's always someone who says, I have kids and my kids didn't do this at the age the book says. <laughs> and I just want to remind you that um, developmental stages are not about the exact age at which a certain a thing is acquired. This is an approximation of the order in which these things uh, are acquired. And it's quite fascinating, um, the fact that children do tend to stick to a certain pattern, to a, a certain sequence. Um, and language learning you, of your first language usually happens in a very natural setting, um, in the home, right, with, with parents. Although it must be said that, of course, now it is very common to for parents to you know, read books and use uh, specialized materials. This is all, this is all wonderful. I'm all for it. And yet, we also know that it is possible for children to learn their first language, even if they didn't have all these fancy schmancy new books, right? Um, by the way, what's the opposite of a natural setting? Yeah, so uh, you would think it's, um, in scholarly terms, it's called either an instructional setting or we would call it um, a classroom setting indeed. So L1 learning happens, or rather L1 acquisition happens in a natural setting. Коллеги, школа Дмитрия Никитина приглашает вас на курс Teaching Adults. Это трехмесячный онлайн-курс, созданный для преподавателей, обучающих взрослых. Программа курса имеет максимально практическую ориентацию. В течение трех месяцев каждую неделю будет проходить одно занятие с экспертами мирового уровня. На занятиях участники курса будут участвовать в обсуждениях и выполнять задания в парах и группах. Курс проводится на английском языке. Подробности можно узнать по QR-коду на экране или по ссылке в описании. Oh, all true. Okay, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you agree with this. You agree with over 60 years of research. Something I forgot to say that <laughs> we uh, we are not uh, reinventing the wheel, right? We are standing on the shoulders of giants. Big scale research into ELT. Why do I keep saying ELT when I mean SLA? We're talking about not the teaching, but rather the learning, the acquisition. Um, it started in the 1960s. So we have over six. This is. Um, this is 60 years of research condensed, okay? Anything else that's true of L1 that may be not up on this list? Something you mentioned, yeah? Basically, there's no testing. No testing, right, yeah, that's true. So there's no testing and children learn in order to use the language rather than to, to pass and test. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's, that feeds into this last point about it being a natural setting. But thank you for this addition. Yeah. Anything else? Yep. They do imitate. Mm -hmm. That's true. They do make mistakes. Yeah, we, we all make mistakes. Yes, it's true. Mm -hmm. Sure, yes, uh, they do, they are creative with language. And again, there are different schools of thought. If you're more um, of a behavioristically inclined person, you might lean towards thinking that children learn by imitating and then they combine whatever they, uh, they hear from their, uh, their adults in their lives. Um, another view of language is that uh, it is a creative act, not just combining, but also creating from within. So that's another very interesting topic. So the question that I would like to uh, address here in front of you, language teachers, is how many of these things check out for second language acquisition? How can we apply this to our teaching context? But first, let's recap. Who speaks in L1? 
Pretty much. Mm -hmm. There is a... Mm -hmm. For learning in L1, children receive thousands of hours of input. Oops. I thought I'd checked this, but okay, all over the place. Uh, that's fine. Okay, we all make mistakes. You remember that. So child, um, children are allowed a... Yeah, there it is somewhere. Okay. Uh, and L1 acquisition follows a set of... Yes, developmental stages. Sorry about that. And it happens in a natural setting. Yes, you got it. Okay, let me clear up this mess. Uh, I've, you've, you can see here that I've switched it up. I've changed L1 to L2 on all of these slides. So what I'd like you to do now in your notebooks, if you could just write down um, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to represent these six points. And uh, next to each number... Could you put a check mark if you think this is true of L2 acquisition, learning a foreign language, um, an X if you think it's false, and a question mark if you think it depends. Don't put question marks everywhere. Kind of give me give me a signal when you're ready. You can like wave at me. Um, there we go. <laughs> Thanks. All right, let's um, let's take it away. So there is one situation in which both of these. Um, yeah, both L1 acquisition and L2 acquisition overlap fully. There is a category of people for whom all of this will be true. For whom? Uh -huh, yeah. So um, more specifically, simultaneous bilinguals, right? And childhood bilinguals. Um, so this could be the case in a bicultural household. An Armenian marrying a Russian and they decide to, um, to bring up their children bilingual in that way. Or maybe they were born in Bashkiria. Right, and they speak Bashkir and Russian and maybe even Tatar, the trilingual. Uh, or maybe, as, um, as is my case, uh, your, your parents were language enthusiasms from Nizhny Novgorod State Univer Linguistic University uh, who decided that the father would speak English, the mother would speak Russian, and they would speak English to each other. So uh, it worked quite well. I get a lot of questions as to how they were able to keep it up and whether I never, you know, never uh, suspected anything was off. Uh, maybe I was a slow child. I don't know. I didn't notice anything was wrong. Uh, I discovered my father spoke Russian when I was six. So, <laughs> but I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to um, to their contribution to my to my future. So um, nonetheless, if we set aside bilinguals, exciting as they are, um, let's talk about the situation that's typical for a lot of people in Russia. When they will learn a second language, such as I don't know, English or French, they'll learn it at school. Um, so, is it true that everyone speaks in L2? No, not at all. Uh, and we know this from personal experience, people can go all the way through school and barely be able to um, put two words together. Unfortunately, not in your schools though. Okay. Uh, there is a critical period for learning L2. So I see that the, there's a mixed reaction and I'm very happy to, for the, uh, you know, to see those of you who are saying no, because um, this is a common misconception. So the critical period hypothesis refers to L1 acquisition. Um, don't think that it means that you can't learn Chinese because you started at the age of 45. Is it going to be difficult? Yes, like with any new skill, but is it going to be impossible? No, and research has shown that there is only one aspect of language in which children have an advantage. Pronunciation. Yes, so research has shown that, uh, th so this was research into children of immigrants, um, the children of immigrants who moved to another country before the age of 14 were very likely to acquire a native-like pronunciation, native-like accent. Uh, in all of the other aspects, you know, 
children, adults can attain a high level of proficiency uh, on, a, on a rather equal footing. So it depends, uh, but mo mostly I should have said no. <laughs> so uh, learners receive thousands of hours of input. Kind of depends. If we're talking about a, um, let's say, a Russian student who's, who lives in Russia and they only learn in the classroom, their input is going to be limited. If they, if they immigrate, of course, yes. So that's why it depends on their individual context. Are they allowed a silent period? Ah, okay, so um, tell me this. I have, I have seen so many ads for schools. I'm sure, I'm sure some of you have used this. I'm sure I've used this at some point. It's, I'm not trying to demonize it. And yet, what do we say students will be able to do with us starting from lesson number one? Yeah, <laughs> so start speaking from the first lesson. It's not a bad thing, but it's something to be aware of. It's something to be mindful of. Uh, I don't think they're really allowed that much. But you're, you're right that we can give them thinking time. Why not? So uh, what about developmental stages? A resounding yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's also fascinating. It's been documented. Read how languages are learned if you want to know more about this. Um, the, uh, they describe the developmental stages for learning questions in English, and you may find that your students follow similar patterns. And as we said, they do they happen in a natural setting? Kind of it depends. Yeah, it depends, but mostly we, we tend to learn in classrooms. So, mm-hmm. One more thing, yeah, one more bit of good news. I told you that these things are all true for simultaneous bilinguals, but there's one, one more bit of good news that I want to share. This is my obligatory picture of a brain scan, so you know this is a very intellectual presentation. <laughs> so uh, these scans show that the higher the level of a student's proficiency, the more their brain activity looks like they are processing L1. So the higher your level of proficiency in L2, the more your brain thinks it's working with your L1. That's good news. Well, we can get there. <laughs> All right. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So you can you can very much think in in a foreign language when you have a high level of proficiency. So uh, I hope this encourages you. I'll just uh, wrap it up with some practical suggestions. They're going to be very simple, uh, based on what what we've talked about here, about what we know from research about how first languages are learned. Support your learners' language learning endeavors. Remind them that it's never too late, no critical period for them, right? Give them ample input. Students do benefit from receiving uh, this input from you. Allow them thinking time. Don't expect immediate answers. Uh, don't expect immediate answers or immediate fluent speech. Acknowledge that their errors are a part, a natural part of learning, and encourage them to surround themselves with the language that they are learning. Are these ideas anything new? Hardly, hardly novel. You know this, but my, um, my hope is that now you can take these into your practice with more consciousness of how this is backed by research. This is not just some idea that we, in, we intuitively feel this is a good idea. No, this is something that has been proven to work. So I encourage you to take this into work and ask yourself, you know, what's one thing, maybe in the break, think based on all of this, of what we've been talking about, what is one thing that you can do for your learners the next time you have a class with them? Thank you so very much for your attention. This is some uh, reading uh, which will be shared with you and I hope to stay in touch with you. Thank you so much, dear Julie. We have a small present for you and a certificate of a speaker. Thank you very much for your delightful talk. We have uh, five minutes for questions. Perfect timing, you know. If you guys have questions to Julie, 
feel free to get the mic. Can you share the previous slide? Yeah, we're asking for the previous slide while I'm walking to someone with a raised hand. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank Hello. you for your talk. It was very useful. Uh, here's a question. Uh, we say we agreed on uh, there is no critical um, period yes. for acquiring language, L2. But there is a scientific opinion. I'm not a scientist, so I'm not good at definitions. Uh, anyway, there is an opinion that the part of our brain that is responsible for acquiring L1 from the very, the very first day uh, is active um, like up to seven or six years, and then it kind of the activity of this uh, part of our brain um, maybe doesn't stop at all, but it's not as active as mm. in our first years. So how about that? Right, so I would say that um, this of course, this subject has been studied, but we still have no definitive answers as to how exactly the and what what part of the brain exactly um, is responsible for language acquisition, right? So um, it may be true for it, it sounds like what you're saying is true of learning your first language. Yeah, it's it's vital. It's vital that a person learns their first language and then, they can build on that. And we have so much anecdotal evidence of people learning a second language, a third language, uh, starting that process well after they were seven years old. So um, I think we can safely say that um, even if um, this brain activity diminishes to a certain degree, it by no means stops and uh, people are well capable of attaining a very high level of proficiency, even if they start learning a language later in life. Uh, there is a caveat. Yes, of course, if you can... Um, so what, what Nina Spad and uh, Nancy Patbaun say in their book is, if you want to start your child early with a second language, it makes, it makes sense if you can provide them with enough input. If you can immerse them in the language, then it makes sense. If you want to take your two-year-old to classes once a week, uh, it may not have the same the effect that you desire. Right. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Thank you. When he was 15 or 16, he started learning German, mm -hmm. and it was epic fail. Uh, he said, no, I can't, I'm not able to study any foreign language. I asked, what about your English as a native? Uh, he has IELTS uh, 8.0 without any preparation. And he said, well, but I've never learned English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew uh -huh. it from I was born. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank but you. Right, right. But then, uh, okay, okay, Elena, Elena, you, uh, yeah, you know, she says, oh, my son was just uh, learning English twice a week at school, not like I have a star ELT mother. <laughs> <laughs> So. All right, thank you very much. You know, you, you have Julia's contacts. She's here with us. 